There's been a suggestion amongst fund managers who specialise in UK stocks that, by comparison to other Western markets, shares in London have suffered from an undervaluation, for whatever reason. With a recent record high for the FTSE 250 index and the benchmark blue chip FTSE 100 index close to 17-month highs, is this still the case? Welcome to this edition of IG's Trade in the Markets podcast. I'm Jeremy Naylor. I'm talking today to Julian Kane, who has been the investment manager of BMO Capital and Income Trust since 1997. The fund has beaten the FTSE All Share Index over this time period and is an AIC dividend hero. That's an investment company that has consistently increased dividends for 20 or more years in a row. In fact, the BMO Capital and Income Trust has been paying and increasing dividends since its inception back in 1992, meaning that next year will mark its 30th anniversary. Julian, welcome. It's a pleasure to talk to you. First of all, explain what you're doing with the Trust and what are its objectives? Uh, Hi, Jeremy. Uh, Thank you for having me on. Uh, Yes, I've been uh, managing BMO uh, Capital and Income now. Uh, I'm in my 25th year uh, of managing it. So there's... um, uh, a lot of history there, but our, our track record, uh, as you as you point out, is is good. Uh, our objectives are to beat the all share index. We're primarily uh, a UK investor into UK companies, uh, and to grow the dividend. Uh, and I'm very glad to say that we've we've done that consistently ever since uh, launch. Uh, you know, we've had some some pretty interesting times uh, over there since '97 when I took over. Uh, we've seen we've been through the tech boom. Uh, we've we've been through 2008 with the financial crisis and and obviously this most recent crisis. So um, we haven't had to wait too long for for exciting periods. Mm. Before we get into the question of valuations, which I mentioned at the top for the London market over other regions, I, um, let's ask you to put the rise that London has and indeed Western markets generally have seen since the COVID lows of last year, and ask what it's what's been leading the advance and, and indeed also what's been lagging? Yes, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because um, I, mean, I think broadly we can take the end of uh, March 2020 uh, as the low point. And since then, uh, the all share index, the broadest index of uh, UK shares is up uh, just over a third, is up 34%. Um, it, in, in truth, there's a lot of variety as to uh, the, the companies that have performed well. Um, of course, one of the complications of, of looking from a low is you often find some of the companies uh, that have performed strongest since were obviously the weakest ones beforehand. So um, it, it's it's largely a, a reversion to mean when one looks at that. Um, but but we've certainly uh, found a number of companies which have almost doubled. Uh, over that period, our, our star performer has been intermediate capital up 150%, uh, certainly quite a few companies up 50% or so. But when, when one looks at the very largest uh, companies within the UK index, thinking of the top end of the FTSE 100, it's notable that some of those have really been uh, laggards. Uh, so over that period, end of March through to the end of June, uh, BP, for example, uh, down 0.3%. Uh, Shell just up eight, uh, Glaxo, uh, Smith Klein up four, uh, HSBC down six. So right at the top end, some of those large companies uh, really haven't had much of a bounce back. And I think that really accounts uh, for the point we made right at the very top that uh, the FTSE 250 index, those smaller, uh, although still substantial, those smaller companies have performed and, and recovered very strongly. Well, well, some of the very, very largest ones uh, have been a bit slow, and that's led to the FTSE 100, uh, where those large companies predominate, um, lagging to FTSE 250. So there's, there's been quite a, a split in performance. Mm. And of course, during the uh, the, the, the COVID um, event, we've, we've seen Brexit come and go. It's finished now. How has Brexit affected things or has it become lost, do you think, in the COVID model? Do we not know yet what the outcome, true outcome is for the markets from Brexit? It, it's always impossible to tell. It, it's not a scientific experiment where we can uh, run various uh, experiments. But I think it's it definitely was a, um, a break on the market. It definitely did cause international investors to stay away from the UK. Um, but of course, that's, it's largely in the rearview mirror. To what extent 
uh, the UK economy uh, has benefited or, or suffered from Brexit is, is completely lost in the noise of uh, COVID, I think. Um, I'm sure there'll be a, economists and statisticians arguing over it for, for years, but um, I think whichever side one is on the philosophical de debate, uh, it's rapidly uh, disappearing into the background. It's in the rearview mirror. Uh, and of course, stock markets look forward uh, and, and try to, to gauge um, how things will perform from, from this point. Um, but also just going back to one of the points you made right at the very start, uh, of course, there are different indices, but uh, just looking at the MSCI um, index the, for, for the UK, uh, that stands at around a 30% discount to the MSCI all country index. So the UK, 30% uh, cheaper than the all country index, which is not to say the UK has historically traded at parity with that index. I mean, historically, it's been at a 10% discount, perhaps something of that order. But uh, it certainly does appear that the UK index uh, is cheaper than it used to be uh, relative to, to a number of international markets. As I said, because of Brexit, it, it had rather fallen off some international investors' radar. Um, and I think that uh, is part of the opportunity going from this point that UK companies uh, as a generality, perhaps are cheaper than some of their international peers. Of course, one of the other aspects of the markets that we've seen is there's a lot of loose money that's been uh, given to us by central banks and, and governments have been bailing out as well. Of course, the furlough money here in the UK has helped a lot of businesses that, as you rightly say, would otherwise perhaps maybe have, would have fallen had they not had that sort of support. So there's a lot of money that's come in from, from the authorities to support the markets. Do you think there's still upside to go here in, in the UK, bearing in mind the markets have had all this support and that at any point may start to have to unwind? It is fascinating, isn't it, to think just what impact all, all the support from government and uh, central monetary authorities has had. Um, and there's no doubt that they uh, learned the lessons of uh, the financial crisis and acted very quickly. Um, I mean, rolling back to the financial crisis, uh, interest rates were cast and quantitative easing was brought in as a tool. Uh, and then it was the first time that it had been used. Uh, this time it was used in a bigger way and more rapidly, so the lessons were learned and uh, put in place uh, even more quickly. And there's no doubt that had a huge uh, positive impact. Um, I think it's very difficult to realistically assess uh, the degree of that impact, but there's no doubt we would be in a in a worse position if um, interest rates were higher, if we hadn't had quantitative easing, and if furlough schemes and other government support hadn't been in place. Um, I, I think it's, it's a, a longer term, perhaps more philosophical question. It, it, it's interesting to think how the government uh, and central banks ever get themselves out of this problem. Um, I mean, we now have, uh, thinking of the UK, the, the UK uh, uh, national debt is uh, rapidly approaching two trillion, uh, and that's not including two trillion of um, unfunded uh, central government uh, pension schemes. Uh, so there's, there's a vast amount of debt out there. Uh, how we get out of this mess, um, I, I think it's going to be very uh, interesting to see. Um, and of course, part of that will be reflected in tax rates. Uh, that's the inevitable consequence and, and uh, comp co company uh, tax rates uh, are going to be increasing and that that will be a bit of a drag on market so we can already start to see how some of this uh, might unwind one of the interesting things I think in the news just recently has been the warning by uh, uh, one of the um, authorities here, I think it's the OBR, um, on the Treasury here in the UK, Rishi Sunak, has been warned that if and when interest rates start to go up, the amount of debt that the government has um, has put our, our way on the taxpayer is going to be very difficult to, to deal with in an interest rate environment that's different from where we are. Just explain how rising inflation is going to affect your approach to the markets, because I think this is going to be an interesting thing as well. If we do start to see entrenched inflation. We've now got what CPI is something like around about two and a half percent. And that is above the Bank of England's target. The BOE has said it's quite happy with that for the time being. But how do you play things as a fund manager, as the manager of this investment trust in an environment which is now potentially going to see prices rising? 
It, it definitely sets companies a, a, a different set of challenges. One of the key things we look for when we are choosing our investments, uh, one of the key things is, is the pricing power that that company has. Now, nearly all companies operate with some form of competition, but some produce better products or services than others uh, and have a degree of pricing power. And we're, we're definitely aiming to invest in those companies which can differentiate themselves and have pricing power. So in an environment where prices are increasing, uh, hopefully they will be able to increase at least as much uh, as a general background. Uh, cost pressures definitely will be a, a factor for some companies as well. Um, you know, they need to make sure that their selling prices rise at least as fast as their cost pressure, otherwise there's a, a squeeze on margin. So that's the second defense that we have. We look for companies which uh, are more profitable than average, which, which have wider profit margins. Um, and we also look for those companies with um, uh, only moderate uh, amounts of uh, balance sheet debt. So in the event that interest rates rise perhaps more dramatically than expected, perhaps because of inflation, then those companies aren't going to be uh, put under a lot of pressure by their balance sheet. So those are the ways that we look to try and defend against um, inflation. Uh, of course, uh, one end up ends up then thinking about uh, equities versus bonds. Um, bonds are all defined in, oh, sorry, most of them uh, are defined in nominal terms. Uh, so if you uh, buy a, a, a bond with a terminal payment of £100, it's £100 regardless of what inflation is between now and the end date. Uh, whereas equities have um, some real uh, inflation adjusted protection. Um, it can be overstated, of course, but investing in real assets like equities uh, does does give some protection against uh, inflation. This is one of the wonderful things, isn't it, of course, as being a fund manager or a manager of a, an investment trust is that you can bend and flex uh, depending on, on the environment. And of course, one of the changing things about the current environment is the uh, involvement now of an increasing number of uh, these private equity companies that want to come in and steal from us as investors the opportunity to invest in certain companies. I'm thinking most recently about this uh, uh, most recent spat or the, uh, the the bidding war that seems to have developed uh, for Morrisons. How does this this um, uh, work into your strategy? Well, you're absolutely right. Morrison's is uh, the most high, high profile and uh, t the most recent. Um, but statistics uh, th that have just um, come out suggest that private equity uh, in the UK alone has bought or announced bids for 366 companies. Uh, so given we're halfway through uh, 2021, that's pretty much two a day. Uh, I mean, it's an extraordinary amount, and uh, it, it's reckoned to be the most since uh, records began back in the 1980s. So private equity is definitely seeing something in the valuations of UK companies that uh, many other investors don't seem to be. Uh, it may well come back to that valuation discrepancy that we talked about uh, earlier uh, so there the, the definitely is something. Uh, private equity have uh, a lot of uh, dry powder they, they want to invest, uh, and they're, they're clearly seeing opportunities in the UK, perhaps more so uh, than elsewhere. So although we don't uh, own uh, in the investment trust shares in uh, Morrison's, we have owned shares mm. in three other companies which have had uh, bids from private equity over the last six months. So we've we had shares in Arrow Global, uh, signature aviation and ultra electronics, all of those uh, have had a uh, bid interest or, or actually been taken over by private equity. So, yes, it helps our performance, but actually, we would uh, quite willingly have held on to those companies um, and, and waited to, to get more benefit for our shareholders from their long term performance. But nonetheless, we've, we've had a short term boost. This is the interesting thing, isn't it, about uh, the involvement of private equity? They wouldn't get involved if they didn't think there was value to be found. I guess this really sort of underscores what we were talking about at the top is the fact that the London markets remain remain good value. Um, how do you see things developing over the summer? Do you think there's still a, a, a bit more upside to go um, on, on the London markets or more upside? I mean, in terms of quantity and, and where the money's going, what's going to happen over the summer? Well, that's that's the, uh, the multi-million dollar question. I think we've 
we've largely had the, the, the easy recovery. Uh, so uh, thinking back to the trough of markets in, in March of 2000, we, we've had that natural rebound. Um, FTSE 250 is back at all time highs. FTSE 100 is uh, not far off uh, its peak, but still a bit behind. So I think we've, we've had the easy recovery. Uh, from here, um, earnings forecasts are increasing. Um, they definitely uh, are, are signs of life as the economy reopens. Um, of course, there's any number of events that could upset that. I think we'll have to see how the proper reopening of the economy goes later on in July. Um, and so I, I think that's going to be not an insubstantial hurdle, but I think as long as uh, earnings forecasts uh, continue to head the right way and, and valuations by historic standards are not demanding, I think those two things will, will provide a bit of uh, support to the market uh, unless there's perhaps uh, some some other unpleasant things to come out of woodwork, but uh, for the moment it, it all seems relatively okay, I would say. I don't know about you, but certainly for me, one of the things I want to see over the summer is is some sort of improvement in the dividend picture. I just want to get to your thoughts on this, because this has been one of the areas where there's been some concern, hasn't there, recently? I'm not quite sure you, as someone that uh, that, that that feeds a lot out of dividends uh, for, for your, your shareholders of the trust. It's, it's been a difficult market, hasn't it, uh, I think, to perform in terms of dividend payments, hasn't it, recently? It definitely has. I mean, there have been a coincidence of events over the last 18 months sort of made it very difficult for uh, any investors, uh, thinking of retail investors, uh, trying to, to live off their dividends. Uh, so not only have we had the uh, shortfall due to COVID and, and business interruption, but of course, uh, BP and Shell, the oil majors have uh, cut their dividends uh, broadly in half uh, because of the falling oil price. So there's been a number of events um, and that has made it very, very difficult. Um, as an investment trust, we're in the fortunate position that um, in good years, we are able to uh, save some of our income from dividends uh, to put that in the reserve. And we've uh, used that over the last 18 months, which has been a relatively lean period. So we've been able to increase our dividends and by using those reserves. Um, we're definitely seeing signs that um, dividends are picking up those companies which uh, had gone into uh, sort of a temporary abeyance uh, because of COVID are starting to pick up the dividend payments again. Um, I think it will be quite a while before we get back to the level of dividend payments that existed uh, pre-COVID, uh, largely because of uh, BP and Shell. Uh, but for many companies, uh, they should get back to the same level relatively quickly, providing the economy picks up and providing um, we're all able to uh, get out and about safely um, as before. Mm. Remind us about the importance of dividends over the value versus growth sort of um, uh, argument. I mean, you you clearly are someone that has outperformed your benchmark. You've continued to deliver these dividends. You, as I said at the top, you are a, an AIC dividend hero, having had 20 years plus of this extraordinary performance. Why dividends? What is it over dividend dividends over 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 growth stocks? So we wouldn't uh, prioritise dividends over growth, and we see both as being uh, a very important part of, of total returns for shareholders. And I think uh, if one looks at the long-term academic studies over, over long time periods, and we're talking decades, for the major markets, uh, dividends historically have been about a half of the total return. So dividends and, and capital return are uh, equally important to us. Um, but we 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 do think that dividends from companies are a good sign that the companies are performing well. I mean, it's a sign that they have uh, positive cash flow. Uh, we certainly wouldn't want companies to uh, restrict their investment in the future. Uh, but if they've got surplus cash to return to shareholders in, in the form of dividends, then that's definitely positive. Mm. Um, one other thing I know that you, you do hold some European stocks, don't you, I think, in the trust. I'd like to ask... Okay why uh, and what these small holdings bring to the portfolio that you can't get from investing in UK companies? Uh, well, we, we've always had uh, flexibility to invest in Europe. 
um, actually work within part of the uh, global uh, equity team uh, within BMO. And so I naturally sit with colleagues who are discussing European ideas or, or even uh, uh, more international ideas. Um, and we do have flexibility at the edge to invest in those. We're, we're capped at 10% uh, because we are primarily a UK uh, fund. Um, but we, we'd looked for opportunities where we can't easily replicate that uh, in the UK. So at the moment, we've just got 2% in Europe. We have a 1% holding in SAP, the software company, 1% uh, holding in Heineken. Neither of those have direct peers in the UK, but we think they're, they're interesting long-term opportunities. Uh, but of course, the UK market itself is very, very international. Um, it's reckoned to be two thirds of revenue from the UK stock market as a whole comes from overseas. Um, you know, we've got a number of companies which are uh, overwhelmingly US based, uh, whether that's uh, Burford, which is a, a provider of uh, finance to litigation, uh, or uh, Hypnosis. We've, we've invested in some of the in, in the two music funds, Hypnosis Songs Fund and, and Roundhill. Um, the music industry is overwhelmingly US based. Um, so we have a lot of international exposure, but only um, sort of a limited amount, which is directly listed overseas. One final question I want to want to put to you, which um, I know uh, a lot of, um, of of our clients at IG um, continually want to know, and that is what fund managers are doing at the moment. What what sectors are you watching at the moment? What stocks are you watching? What are you buying at the moment? Well, it, it, it's tempting to think that. Um, it's a vast hub of activity that, that fund managers are constantly buying and selling. The truth is um, our turnover rate is relatively low. I mean, we, we typically turn over less than 20% of the portfolio uh, each year. So most of our work is about trying to understand the companies we invest in ever better, trying to look at new opportunities. Uh, and so we have been uh, researching only last week, we were looking at software opportunities, um, for, for the investment trust. Um, but I think if, if one were to look at the top 10 holdings that we have at any one stage, uh, those are the most interesting opportunities that we think uh, there are going to be uh, across the next year. Uh, we certainly don't aim to change the portfolio uh, because of a change in uh, viewers to what's happening in the economy. Um, we think it's much more important to focus on the underlying uh, individual circumstances uh, for companies. Um, but as it, as it happens over the next three, six, 12 months, uh, I think it, it's going to be unusually important. I mean, it, it, it feels a little bit as if we're in a snow globe, that everything's been shaken around. Uh, the economy is in a bit of a state of flux, having had a huge collapse and now quite a strong recovery. Um, so I think we'll, we'll be looking to see over the next three to six months just how um, how things settle down uh, and, and what is left. Uh, but in the meantime, we, we think the companies we've got in the portfolio really are uh, the most interesting, uh, which, which does include IG, I must confess. I mean, IG <laughs> is just outside of our, our top 10, but uh, we, we do think IG itself with, with the uh, US acquisition is, is an interesting opportunity. Good. Look, well, Junior, we, we've got to leave it there, but thank you so much indeed for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to be able to catch up with, with your thinking uh, and uh, your thoughts around the, the income trust that you manage. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Julian Kane is the investment manager of the BMO Capital and Income Trust. For more videos from us here at IGTV, join us on Twitter at IGCom, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.